so, so I, I'm going to tell you about uh, the discovery itself, but there's quite a bit I have to tell you before that, and I have to do it in a very short time. So we're going to cover all of quantum field theory, all of particle physics in 18 minutes. Um, it's no small, well, it's not, you'll do fine. I think you'll be fine. The, the, we'll have an exam at the end. Um, so this is our experiment, the CMS experiment. Uh, I've titled the talk, um, Searching for the Genetic Code of Our Universe. What we do in particle physics, in some sense, is very analogous to that, and I hope I can show you why that's the case. Now, like I said, it's quantum field theory, it's, it's Higgs fields, it's Higgs mechanisms. We can get very, 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 very uh, obscure very quickly, but what I'm going to try to do is, with a lot of images and fairly simple analogies and some, hopefully, some nice conceptualization of some of these things, give you a sense of what we're doing and why we're doing it, how it works, and, and why it's interesting. And, and hopefully you could take some of this away with you. Um, now, the title is also kind of uh, pretentious, I'd say. Uh, but that depends a bit on your perspective. I, I, told a, 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 I asked a, a friend of mine who's a physicist uh, studying string theory if she was interested in what we might learn at the LHC. And she said, no, not really. I said, why not? She said, because it only pertains to our universe, and, you know. So, so in some sense, this is a very modest talk. I'm only talking about our universe here. Okay. So let me give you some background. Now, we have something we call the standard model of particle physics. And this took about 100 years to put together. Lots of theoretical physics had to be developed. Many subatomic particles had to be discovered. And it is really something like a new periodic table of the most elementary particles that we've built. And this is what it looks like. There was a, a famous Nobel Prize winner who, who, flap, who flashed this slide at one point and said, after decades and decades of research and billions of dollars, this is all we know. <laughs> but uh, in a sense, this is good. This is what we want. We'd like to find a very simple underlying explanation of the universe. And what we discovered is that there are three sort of generations of these kind of particles, quarks and leptons, they're fermions. That means they have half-integer spin. You don't have to worry about that. And those things, these particles are actually what build structure, build atoms and things like this. And then there are particles that carry the force, sort of glue the other particles together, very simple. And there's a key piece, other piece that we hadn't found. So let me show you this again. This is one of the greatest achievements of 20th century science. This is a look at the same particles, but you can see their masses on a log scale. So there's quite a big difference between the lightest and the heaviest, maybe a factor of a million. Actually, we only see these particles. These make up the protons, for example, and atoms. But all the other ones turn out to be, even though we can't see them, very crucial to how the universe is structured and how everything behaves. And that's why we do what we do. And I'll repeat that. There's one missing piece, and that's the Higgs particle. Or at least it was missing. Here you can see the masses of the quarks. They go from really tiny to really high, and we don't know why. And that's one of the things we'd like to understand. OK, so what is the Higgs particle? So while we were developing this modern theory of fundamental uh, forces and interactions, we kind of hit a snag. The particles that carry the forces have to be massless. We knew that from our equations. But the data seemed to indicate otherwise. And in fact, we didn't understand why any particle should have mass, or what was mass, for that matter. Now, massless particles, they move at the speed of light. Okay? And so theorists came up with an ingenious idea. Suppose there's a force field that fills the universe that somehow slows particles down to below the speed of light. That would effectively give them mass. So in fact, as my predecessor was saying, you have something like this. You have this field that fills the universe, and as particles pass through it, they get kind of caught up in it, some more than others. And that's how they become massive. They basically become slowed down. And that's what the Higgs field is. So what's the difference between a field and a particle? Now, this is where it gets a little bit counterintuitive, and it's very hard to understand this without studying quantum field theory. But fields have particles associated with them. We call them field quanta from quantum mechanics. And they carry the force of that field. Particles inter interact, in fact, by exchanging these force carriers. And here, for example, I give you a very simple case where you have electrons, which are 
basically repelling each other by exchanging a photon. So this is how forces work. There are other ways, other processes that are much more complex, and they become very counterintuitive, but this is a good way to look at things. Now, quantum field theory I mentioned, the basis here is that energy and mass are equivalent. So strange things can happen, actually, too, in quantum field theory. You can have a particle and an antiparticle pop into existence out of empty space, something like this. Here you have two top quarks, and then they can vanish back into it. This is called a, a quantum fluctuation, and these are virtual particles. It sounds a bit magical, but it's actually really critical to everything we understand. And it has very far-reaching uh, consequences. So, in fact, the structure of the universe turns out, because of these virtual particles being everywhere, to depend on particles that don't exist in the usual sense, some of which um, existed earlier when the universe was much hotter and much younger. And this is why we do what we do. We're trying to find these particles to understand how they affect our universe. Here, for instance, is uh, an event, event display of some of the first top quarks ever seen in the 1990s at Fermilab. So, what makes us so sure that this Higgs particle should exist? Well, the theory has very predictable consequences. For instance, it predicts these very heavy force carriers of the weak nuclear force, the W and the Z particles. W should have a mass of about 80 GeV. Now, this unit, I'll come back to in a second. The Z should have a mass of about 91 GeV, and the proton has a mass of 0.9 GeV. So, these particles are much heavier than the proton, even though they're much smaller. Now, when they're made, they're very unstable, and they decay almost instantly. And we can see the tracks of the decay products, and we can see energy deposits from the uh, decay products in our detectors, and we can use these to reconstruct the mass of the original particle or many of its other properties. So here's, for example, what we predict we would see if we look for Z particles decaying to muons. You count the number of events at different mass values, you'd expect to find a peak. This is what a particle resonance looks like, a peak at the mass of 91.1. And then there's some background from other things. Now let me show you what we actually see. This is what we see. The black dots show our measurements. So the Z and the W were exactly as we predicted they would be, and this really made us take this, this idea of the Higgs very seriously. Now there are fundamental connections between particles, and this is where uh, it gets kind of interesting. Fundamental particles actually all interact with each other all the time through these virtual uh, reality kind of interactions that I mentioned. So the mass of the W particle, for instance, depends a lot on the mass of the top quark and a lot on the mass, a little bit on the mass of the Higgs. And it's through this kind of a process. A W can decay into a top and a bottom quark, and then those can fuse back together and become a W again. A w can radiate a Higgs and reabsorb it and become a W again. These things are happening all the time. Basically, the identity of any of these elementary particles is really not separable from what it can become or decay into. And this is how the, the universe works at a very, very basic level. How is this possible? Well, here's a good way to visualize it. The vacuum of space-time is really a very interesting uh, place. Imagine that you have kind of an invisible fabric that cloaks all these particles that could exist and encodes how they could interact. That's really what space-time is. Not anything can happen in space-time. Only these kind of things. These virtual particles are always waiting for an opportunity to interact with real particles. So if you provide enough energy in a very small region, you can pull particles from this fabric into our reality. And to some extent, that's exactly what we do. In fact, if the energy is large enough, we can pull out particles that are very heavy that we've never seen before. And these are the keys to understanding the underlying code of our universe. So, how do you get a lot of energy in one small spot? Well, we do it with what we call the Large Hadron Collider. So let me show you that. I have a nice picture of it. Basically, we have rings of magnets 
that focus beams and circulate them, each time they go around, we give them a little acceleration with an electric field. And then when they get energetic enough, we switch them to another ring that's bigger. We can make the particles accelerate to even higher energies. And then finally to this yellow one, which is the Large Hadron Collider. And it shows you the scale of the thing. It's 100 meters underground. It took, it took a long time to paint those stripes, by the way. Um, and here's another view of it. And you can now get kind of a sense of how big it is, because you can see Geneva Airport here. It's really quite a huge machine. And it's so huge because the particles are accelerated to such high energies that the magnets are limited in how well they can keep them on track. So we have to build a very big machine. And there we have four experiments. Two of them I'll talk about a little bit today. My experiment, CMS, or the experiment I'm a part of. I don't own it. And Atlas. But there are a couple of others, uh, LHCB and ALICE, that are very dedicated to very specific things. And I won't go into those. It's a bit like Swiss chocolate. I'll let you think about that for a second. The LHC magnets that keep the particles on their track, they store a huge amount of energy. In fact, it's enough to melt 12 tons of copper. That's how much energy is in these magnets. And it's the kinetic energy of an A380 at 700 kilometers per hour. How much energy is stored in the actual beams? Well, it's equivalent to 90 kilograms of TNT, or 15 kilograms of chocolate. I bet you didn't know that chocolate has more calories than TNT. <laughs> OK, now let me tell you about the experiments. The experiments are very big, because we, we ram these protons together at really high energy. Things can come out at really high energy, and we want to measure those things. We have to build very, very large experiments to be able to bend the particle tracks in magnetic fields and actually measure their, their momenta. So here is Atlas, and I'll show you how it, was, uh, how it looked as it was being built. This is uh, 30 stories underground. And there you see a person standing amidst it. Now, lots gets filled in here, in fact. And I'll show you, in fact, with CMS a little bit more. See, Atlas is just like CMS in the sense that there's about 40 countries involved, hundreds, hundreds of uh, institutions, and thousands of, of physicists. So CMS, this is the experiment um, I'm heading in right now. We had to build it, on, build it on the surface and then lower it. And this piece right here, the central piece of the experiment, is 4.4 uh, 4 million pounds. It had to be lowered 30 stories with only, if you look there, we had three inches of clearance. So it was quite tricky to do that. And here, this sets the scale. If you go back to this picture, you see the magnet. It's kind of hard to tell how big this giant solenoid magnet is. If you come here, you can see. It's quite big. It's the largest magnet ever built. We also recycled some things to build. Actual old casings from the uh, Russian military were made into uh, parts of our experiment. And here we, I show what's happening as we're inserting the uh, central tracking system. OK. And then this is the picture I showed at the beginning. This is when the detector was ready to close. This is actually the beam line here. OK. And that's where the protons go. And then they collide in the center of the detector, which is a bit over here to the left. OK. There are a lot of people involved. This is one eighth of the people that were involved in the CMS experiment. And as the presenter mentioned that, uh, before me, that there were about 4,000 people involved altogether. OK. So how do we reconstruct what happens in a collision? This is the detector looked at end on. And you notice it's kind of uh, got a lot of cylinders involved. And if I replace it with a cartoon, you can see this. All the different cylinders are different kinds of detectors that detect different par uh, properties of the particles as they pass through them. And when we sum up all the information from all the different layers, we can tell if they're pions, muons, kaons, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how we reconstruct these things. Now, we collide these beams, as I mentioned. There's two beams of protons. Each beam has 1,380 bunches. Each bunch has 160 billion protons. Lots of numbers. And they collide four different places. And whenever they cross, even though there's 160 billion protons in each bunch, you only get about 20 or 30 pairs of protons that, that collide. And usually what happens is they just break up. The proton breaks up, the quarks go flying out, and you make new particles, but it's not very interesting. Sometimes, though, it gets very interesting. Let me just show you a simple event. This is our first uh, event of the 2012 era. And this is a real event. Everything you're seeing now is simulated, but you'll see what the event actually looks like. When the two bunches cross, here's 30 pairs of protons colliding. And those are the tracks of the particles coming out. 
and the blue represent energy deposits in the energy measuring part of the experiment. Okay, we're done, come on. Uh -huh, good. I can't seem to get past this one. Ah, very good. Now, if two quarks inside hit very hard, you can have so much energy that you can produce something really interesting. Here I show, for instance, a diagram of two quarks interacting, forming a very energetic gluon, and then decaying to top quarks. Now, this, you know, you, you've not seen these kind of diagrams before, but if I showed you the masses involved, it's kind of like throwing two ping pong balls at each other and having two bowling balls come out, because the top quarks are so much more massive. Let me show you a lead-lead collision. This is just fun. Now we're throwing two lead atoms at each other, so you have 400 protons and neutrons colliding. And that's what that looks like. So we often talk about these detectors as something like a camera. They have about 80 million pixels, but they're not ordinary cameras. They take up to 40 million pictures per second, which is pretty hard to do. And the pictures are three-dimensional with extremely high precision, one micron level precision. And the detectors at 15 and 31 million pounds each are not very portable. And some of the challenges we have are that these collisions are very frequent. Right now, it's about 16 million per second. And the things we're looking for are really rare. So the Higgs events we're looking for, some of them are one in a trillion. Okay? So we have to run a long time, continuously, round the clock. Many, many collisions have to be collected. We keep about 1,000 of these 16 million every second, and that's still a lot of data, in fact. In fact, we end up with about 22 petabytes of data per year. That's a petabyte, I think, is a million gigabytes, correct? Someone in the front row is in there. I think, um, so it's a ton of data. We have to transfer it out all over the world, basically, to process it, because it's too much to hold in one place. So it goes out to 34 countries, about 100,000 uh, computers are involved. All right, so I'm gonna show you the Higgs searches, finally. Here is a Higgs event, we think, or a possible candidate. And what you see are lots of low energy tracks. This is debris from the protons breaking up. It's not very interesting, but you notice these two big red bars, all right? Those are actually two photons coming out sideways. They're very, very energetic. This is a very rare event, and this is what we look for. The Higgs particle could decay to two photons, and they would look something like this. But there are lots of other ways of making two photons. And so you end up with a background of events that's very smooth like this. But if you find an excess in any one place at a particular mass value, okay, that's indication of a possible new particle. And in fact, this little bump is only a few hundred events, okay? That's an excess corresponding to a couple of hundred events at about 125 GeV. And it took how many collisions to find it? Well, it took 10 to the 15. So it took a long time of running and a lot of sifting through the data to find these guys. But this little bump actually really represents a major, major discovery. Here in Atlas, we see a different kind of event that we're looking for. The Higgs can also decay to two Z particles. I mentioned those before. And they can decay to electrons as well as muons. And this is an event with four electrons. And you reconstruct the Zs, and then you reconstruct what you get from the two Zs, and you find, in fact, lots of things that you would expect. This is a hard-to-read kind of a, a display. There's lots of data that matches expectations. But there's one place where the data is much above expectation, around 150, 125. And if you look at CMS on a, on a uh, blown-up scale, we also see an excess at 125. So these little telltale signs, actually, are what tell us that we have something new, and we've just begun to see it emerging. It's very, very uh, new. They point to a major discovery. Both experiments see excesses at the mass of 125 in several different channels. There are some I didn't show you. And after very, very intricate studies and very careful checks that took us months and hundreds and hundreds of people involved, everything held up. We know this is not something we've seen before. Everything's consistent with what's expected for the Higgs. And the significance, statistically, is adequate to, to claim a discovery. But this is really just the beginning. Here is the cover of the publication 
with the two results that came out in July. It's been 48 years, I have just two slides left, uh, since the standard model Higgs boson was predicted. It's been 20 years to design and build these very complex accelerator and, and, and experiments, the most uh, complex ex experiments ever built in the history of physics. It took three years to acquire the data, and it really took a generation of intense effort by thousands of, of physicists, uh, engineers, and technicians to make this all possible. So what's next? Well, we have to figure out what it is. We're pretty sure it's the Higgs. We're sure it's a Higgs, I should say, but we have to study its properties because there's a chance it's not the simple standard model Higgs, in which case we have something of a revolution which could help us understand a lot of things. And that could take us to new, uh, new uh, frontiers, actually. So stay tuned. <laughs>